Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Politics and Prose Live. We're joined here tonight by Stephanie Kelton and Zachary Carter to talk about their new books. Uh, before we get started, I just want to give some quick housekeeping notes for everyone. You can purchase both of tonight's books by clicking on the green button right below the speakers. Uh, we encourage everyone to do that um, to help support our authors and also politics and prose. Also, uh, tonight we're going to encourage you guys to ask questions, which many of you already have. Um, the back portion of our event will be dedicated to your questions. Um, so if you click on the ask a question widget at the bottom, you can see where people have already asked questions. You can ask your question and you can vote on the questions that you're most interested in hearing our authors answer. And lastly, just a reminder to everyone that uh, you can see us, but we cannot see you. So feel free to relax and get comfortable. So without any further ado, it is my honor to welcome Stephanie Kelton, Professor of Economics and Public Policy at the State University of New York at Stony Brook and a Bloomberg contributing columnist. Tonight she's here to discuss her new book, The Deficit Myth, Modern Monetary Theory and the Birth of the People's Economy. Tonight we are also uh, lucky to be joined by Zachary D. Carter, who is a senior reporter at Huffington Post, where he covers Congress, the White House and economic policy. Tonight he will be discussing his book, The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. So without any further ado, here are Zachary and Stephanie. Hi, everybody. It's really nice to be with you. Um, I want to start by talking to Stephanie about her book, uh, which is called The Deficit Myth. Now, Stephanie, all I hear about when I listen to economic commentary is this talk about debt and deficits. There was a a tweet from the Lincoln Project, this new group of a sort of anti-Trump Republicans talking about how Donald Trump had run up $17.8 trillion in national debt. There are always columns running in the, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times about debt, debt, debt. But your book calls the deficit, it talks about it as a myth. What do you mean by the deficit myth? And why did you feel that this book was important to write at this point in time? Well, thank you. Um, and thanks to Politics and Prose for having both of us here to spend some time talking about our new projects. It's a uh, really pleasure to be with you. Um, so first, let me start by saying that um, increasing the deficit and adding to the national debt is probably the least bad thing that Donald Trump has done. Uh, I think we should just get that out there. Um, look, I understand that we are inundated from you know, the media, uh, mainstream press, politicians, everybody who talks about deficits and debt, virtually everybody talks about it in a negative way, right? When we hear people bring up the deficit, it is almost always the case that they're there, they are there to complain about the thing or the national debt. These are presented to us as, um, as problems uh, at, at a, at a minimum and as a national security threat or a threat to future generations. I mean, a real danger to us individually, your share of the national debt, borrowing from China, all of these things that create a lot of anxiety uh, on the part of the American people. So when you say, you know, why did you write this book? I think that, you know, my, my hope is that I can reduce the level of anxiety. I mean, uh, I start in chapter one of the book telling a story about, you know, being a child and watching the television show Sesame Street. And, you know, Sesame Street was really good at teaching us to sort of separate things into categories. These things are similar. These things are unlike the rest of them. And, you know, as a kid, my sister and I would watch and we would play along as the images came on the screen and they'd put up you know, a bicycle and an automobile and a train and a tennis shoe. They say, you know, one of these things is not like the other. And so we would holler back at the television, the shoe, the shoe is not like the others, you know? And so I, in the book, I say that I'm an adult now, but I'm still hollering back at the television all the time because I turn on the TV and I hear, you know, often, you know, so-called experts on economics talking about the deficit or the debt in ways that I think are just fundamentally wrong and that they are getting some big things wrong and I'm hollering back at the TV. So the reason I wrote the book, I think, is to try to get us to a better place, to a better understanding where we can have a more meaningful and fruitful discussion about deficits and the national debt and government finances 
that ultimately, I hope, will get us to a place where we make better public policy. So a, a really common criticism that you hear from people who talk about modern monetary theory or Stephanie Kelton is that is that you believe that deficits don't matter, they're irrelevant. This, this just came out in a, you know, there was a, a relatively nasty review in the Wall Street Journal where somebody accused you of this. Um, do you believe that deficits don't matter? What, what, what do you make of this critique? So, you know, it's funny because if you go to uh, the webpage that I created to talk about the book, it literally reads, uh, Dick Cheney says deficits don't, Reagan proved deficits don't matter. He was wrong. So there I am, right, saying I disagree with Cheney's characterization that deficits don't matter. My argument in the book and throughout my work is really that deficits matter, but not the way in which we've been taught to believe that they matter. So we've been taught, as I said earlier, that, that they're inherently dangerous, undesirable, that you, there's something that you do in times of crisis because you have no choice like now but that in no more normal times, deficits are something we ought to be avoiding. Governments should not spend more than they take in, in the form of taxes. They should strive to balance budgets and avoid um, increasing the debt. And so I walk through in the book a variety of ways in which deficits matter. And one important um, way is every deficit is good for someone. I mean, that is the reality. And so when you see the Republicans passing these huge tax cuts at the end of 2017, these were massive tax cuts that Republicans passed knowing that they would massively increase deficits. So if Republicans really believe that deficits were inherently dangerous and that they were gonna wreak havoc and all these bad things were gonna happen and future grandchildren, would be, they wouldn't do that. The reality is that the Republicans understand, I think perfectly well, that every deficit is good for someone. And so what they did was to massively cut taxes on corporations and the wealthiest people in this country, 83% of the benefits went to people in the top 1% of the income distribution. In other words, those who least needed the help, but the deficits that the government ran and are running become financial surpluses in somebody else's pocket. Their deficits become our surpluses. Their red ink is our black ink. The question is, who's our, right? Who's benefiting from that financial windfall? Republicans are happy to run deficits because they know that they create a financial surplus that they can direct into the hands of the people that they're most interested in helping. And what I, I would hope is that Democrats would reach the point where they too understand that deficits aren't something we should be striving to wrestle down and reduce, but that the deficit can be used as a tool to carry out a, an agenda that serves the broader public, that benefits people who are truly hurting. And so that's a lot of what I talk about in the book. It feels to me like when I when I read your work, uh, whether it's in this book or you know, blog posts, op-eds that you've written over the years, interviews that you've done, uh, there is a real emphasis on on economic distribution, whether it's the distribution of actual resources, how you how you move supply chains from point A to point B, or what kind of society you want to live in in terms of particularly economic inequality. And the focus seems to be on on a sort a sort of social vision more so then uh, uh, I, I don't want to I don't want to say you're you're not an economist here, but but the the way that traditional economists focus on on debt and deficits is sort of the primary way of understanding the economy. You seem to have, to, to my mind at least, a, a sort of broader social vision there. Um, first of all, is that an accurate description of of the way you think about your your own work? And second, what do you think it says about the economics profession that we have this focus on on debt and deficits instead of these other uh, these other social priorities. Yeah, so it's a, um, you know, in the in the book, chapter seven is called the deficits that matter. And so that's exactly what I'm trying to do to, to, to redirect our obsession with deficits to the, the very real deficits that surround us in our everyday lives and that um, are crushing in many ways for millions and millions of people in this country. So you are right that for me, uh, I look at the federal budget as a world document. And the federal government, they are our elected officials, and they get to write and pass a budget 
that determines where financial resources will be dedicated and to what ends. And in my view, anyway, um, our elected officials are there to act in the interest of the broad majority, I mean, the, the people of this country, right? And if the people of this country indicate that they want, you know, everybody to have health care, for example, then I think that Congress should be looking for ways to budget our nation's real resources so that we can deliver those that material well-being to people. So MMT is about saying, listen, the easiest part of any uh, agenda is finding the money. That's the easiest part. The challenge is how many of our nation's real productive resources, how many of our workers, how many people, how many, um, how much of our factories, how many machines, how much real resources do we want directed to producing public goods, healthcare, education, infrastructure, um, you know, those sorts of things, and how much do we want to leave to the private sector? And so there is a balance there. And um, when I talk about addressing the deficits that matter, whether it's climate or retirement security or, um, you know, education, student loan debt, health care, all of that is in that chapter that I talk about. Um, I am. I'm, I'm focusing in ways that are maybe not common among economists to think about directing real resources to solve real problems in our economy. I have to say th that uh, that focus reminds me quite a bit of a fellow who I've spent a great deal of time studying. I don't know if you've heard of him, Stephanie. Uh, his his name is John Maynard Keynes. Uh, are you mm -hmm. familiar with his work? Am I familiar with his work? I don't know. <laughs> so I, I, I name I, rings a bell. <laughs> That guy, <laughs> that guy, yeah. So a, a, a famous political cartoon on that on that mug uh, of, of Keynes looking kind of like a spider in a chair. I think, frankly, <laughs> um, very lanky. Yeah, you know, I, I, one of the things I loved about studying Keynes is that he is uh, he, he's one of these kind of broad broad thinkers. He's um, he's he's kind of an economist by accident. I think I I, I feel like he you know his, his life is is one where he's he's constantly surrounded by all these philosophers and artists and these great writers like Virginia Woolf and Lytton Strachey and E.M. Forster who you know you know all the Merchant Ivory you know sweepy melodramas from the 80s and 90s uh, you know he would get you know early drafts of E.M. Forster books before before they came out and Forster would be like don't tell anybody but but let me know what you think Maynard and he, he was concerned with art and letters and ideas and and this sort of big grand vision of of, of society, and he, he kind of just realized that economics was the uh, the science that he could he could pursue that would give his ideas sort of access to power, and I I feel like when I read his work, you know, his very technical economic work like like the general theory is often extremely dense and you know kind of like. It's kind of like eating a pretzel covered in thorns. It's just like very nasty and, at times. But but a lot of his other work, his essays, uh, his letters, they're very very clear. He has the ability to distill these big complex ideas uh, into into you know fragments that ordinary people can understand. Because I think he's he's fundamentally concerned with ordinary people and what they can understand. Because he believes the economy is not this sort of like weird thing that has to be hived off away from social policy. He believes it's it's a way to address the social policy that he cares about. He's concerned with war and peace and authoritarianism and democracy and all the big problems of the early 20th century. And when I read that stuff, uh, I, I have to say, I feel like the, the economics profession today doesn't seem to be working at the same level of ambition um, for the most part. Um, there, there are exceptions clearly, and there are a lot of very good economists out there. But the idea that you would you would sit down with an I, I feel like economists are there to tell us no, that we can't do the things that we want to do. We can't solve the problems that we need to solve. And so my question for you, uh, Stephanie, here is, what are the big problems that economists need to solve today if it's not debt and deficits? What what should the great minds from academia be focusing their attention on uh, if it's not debt and deficits? Well, 
I think in the, in the moment, it seems to me that the obvious answer is unemployment. Um, and this is, of course, the big problem that Keynes wrestled with in the general theory, because the economy was in the midst, the grips of the Great Depression. And so here we find ourselves yet again with, you know, tens of millions of people who have lost jobs in the course of the shortest span of this magnitude of job losses in our uh, nation's history. So we got to figure that out. I, I think that probably right now there's no higher calling than to deal with unemployment. But, you know, you you know this. You, you and I know a lot of these people. There are economists all over the country. Now, I, you and I might agree that there aren't enough, but there are economists that are also engaging in the climate space, not necessarily as experts on climate science, but there are environmental economists who are working in collaboration. You mentioned Keynes, you know, working alongside philosophers and people with er er areas of expertise outside his own. And I think those collaborative efforts are really important, um, whether it comes to healthcare or education. There are things that economists can do and, and ways in which we can be useful um, but we, I think, um, need to sometimes show some humility and recognize that scholars in other fields also bring an awful lot to the table and to the extent that we could work better together. And I think economists are sometimes not very good at this. We think that our discipline sits higher in the, in the pyramid, uh, in the hierarchy than a lot of other disciplines. And um, so, you know, unemployment, healthcare, the environment. I mean, the list of problems, as I said, I did a chapter in the book on this, but um, I want to talk about your book and I want to oh. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> I want you to share with all these uh, wonderful people who are here. What made you want to study this man who I think is a fascinating figure, but what was it about him that made you want to study and spend years, I presume, studying his his life? So I didn't come at Keynes from a, a traditional economics background. I don't have a PhD. I don't have a master's. I studied philosophy as an undergraduate. But in 2006, the job I sort of fell into after I graduated from college was a job as a financial journalist. And I was living in central Virginia, working for a trade publication that's now part of S&P Global. Um, but I, I wasn't terribly thrilled to be covering banking as a 22 year old, it just didn't seem like, you know, the most exciting job in the world. But then the banking sector did me a huge favor and exploded. And it became very, very exciting to cover the banking sector. And, and there was this very clear shift that happened over the course of 2007 and 2008, where everybody who I talked to in the markets was like, oh, we, got, we, all, we all agree that markets are rational. We all agree that supply and demand find automatically find a prosperous equilibrium. We all know that, uh, that, that thing, things are going to work out if the government just stays out of the way. And they moved very quickly to saying, oh, well, obviously, the government needs to intervene immediately to rescue the financial sector. Otherwise, the economy is going to collapse and society is going to fall into disrepair. And, and when that shift happened, I mean, people were very open with me, at least financial market participants were very open with me about the fact that they were changing their minds. I, I don't want to accuse these people of hypocrisy. Um, but, but all of a sudden, they were talking about this guy John Maynard Keynes and saying his ideas were were relevant and they were they were key in a way where previously he had been sort of kind of dismissed to the academic margins. If you were a Keynesian specialist as an economist, you know, I, I guess you could have like Paul Krugman had a job at the New York Times, but academically it wasn't taken super seriously. You you had to work for a particularly, you know, specialist Keynesian institution if you were an academic. And and in the markets, people just like didn't really talk about it like it was a real thing. And suddenly it was just totally legitimate. And I thought that was incredible. I thought that shift was remarkable, not only because people had changed their tune, but because the, the possibilities that were available in terms of policy making just seemed incredibly broad. And the specific policies that we pursued in 2008, uh, where we you know, basically bailed out the financial sector and let everybody else kind of twist in the wind, that struck me as a not terribly great way to go about rescuing an economy. And it struck me as odd that a fellow who was this famous would, would prescribe something like that. So I went and started reading Keynes and I tried to read the general theory. Uh, and like I said, the general theory is a, it's a real nasty piece of work. Like if, if you want to, 
if you want to give yourself a big headache, go just open the general theory and start on page one and try to get through it. It's, it's a brilliant book. It's one of the great, great triumphs of Western letters, but it is also, it, it's like reading, you know, Nietzsche or Heidegger or something where you have to slog through dozens of pages of just nasty, crazy nonsense until you get to that one gem where suddenly, you know, the, the, the seas part and the skies open and you're like, oh my goodness, this man is brilliant. But I, I went and read uh, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, which is his critique of the Treaty of Versailles, the, the, the treaty that ends World War I in 1919. And this is a much clearer document. It's much easier to understand. Economically, it's not nearly as sophisticated as what made, makes him famous, I think, today as an economist. But the moral and philosophical force of the document and the political ideas that are involved, I think, are just as urgent as everything in the general theory. And as as really any piece of political writing I've ever encountered. And that book just, it just kind of lit a fire under me. I was like, this guy is on to something really serious. It's a book about political accountability. He says, essentially, the leaders who have organized this peace treaty have saddled every country with insurmountable debts, whether it's the war debts for the allies as, you know, that, that they've assumed over the course of the war or the reparations duties that have been, that have been assessed on Germany. Uh, that you know, who lost World War One, obviously, and as a result, people are going to be shipping money across different borders, and they're not going to have the funds available to mobilize those real resources that are going to make their economies recover and and generate prosperity. And the the, the really, I think, brilliant point is that that's not just going to be a, an economic problem. People are going to going to blame outsiders for the fact that they're not recovering, and they're not going to be totally wrong because they will be shipping capital abroad that could be spent at home. And, and that's going to fuel international resentment. It's going to lead to dictatorship and war. And I thought that connection between economic dysfunction and social crisis was something that I just had not, you know, I, I felt this sense of unfairness over the bailouts in 2008. Um, but I didn't feel like there were economists who were putting it together saying like, okay, well, the reason these numbers appear to add up on paper, but actually result in socially terrible results. Um, that just didn't feel like that was something that was coming coming down from on high from people, whether they were Republicans or Democrats in positions of, of economic expertise. And Keynes, in, in, in his work, I felt like this deep, deep moral force. Um, and, and also this, this concern for for things that were not really about dollars and cents. Like he, he was concerned about the equations balancing, but he was really just afraid of dictatorship and war. He was focused on that big kind of social problem. Um, it's you know not the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's like, it's like the march of fascism at the end of the rainbow. But he was, he was afraid of, of, of something bad happening to society and to commute into his community. Um, not of, of, you know, an equation that failed to balance appropriately. Um, and, and so I, I just became completely obsessed with the guy. And I, I was a philosophy student, so I found a lot of his ideas, you know, it was very easy to understand him as a philosopher, um, more so than as a, you know, e econometrician. He, he, was not, uh, he was not somebody who cared deeply about mathematics, even though he studied mathematics as an undergraduate when he was when he was at Cambridge, he doesn't even have a degree in mathematics. He's one, in economics. He's one of the greatest economists who's ever lived. It is Greece in mathematics, not not economics, because he's he's kind of early to the profession. It's something that's just kind of being born when he's studying as an undergraduate. So I wrote this book because of the crash of two thousand eight and my feeling of confusion about where the world was going and my feeling of deep kind of moral despair. And I felt like Keynes was somebody who could speak to that sense of uh, of, of uncertainty uh, and and of unfairness, frankly, that was uh, that was in the air at the time. I feel like you know you must feel almost in a sense like you know him, like you're so inside his head that and you and you come to this in the moment right on the you know precipice of the financial crisis and the meltdown, global economic meltdown. And you talk about, you know, the, the Treaty of Versailles and the reparations that were imposed on Germany and how Keynes could foresee uh, the kinds of the rise of fascism and the social unrest and all of that. How did it feel working on this project and looking at what was happening in Europe where, you know, the Greek debt crisis, not just Greece, but the countries, did it 
not feel like you were living the moment? Oh, it was terrifying. I mean, I, I remember being, so I went to Cambridge to go through his, his papers at King's College at Cambridge University in uh, the spring of 2017. And, and this was past the like worst days of, of the Greek debt crisis, but every single week you would see headlines about, about you know, Golden Dawn and these, these horrible like far right fascist parties that were rising up in Greece and other, other countries. And you know, it wasn't just like these fringe parties, the conservative parties were sort of also uh, sort of subsuming these, these fringe parties and, and making it part of their, their kind of like more mainstream uh, conservative, uh, you know, policy agenda, and uh, and it was it was deeply frightening. You you would just go through his papers, and he'd be like, "I'm really really worried that Germany's going to go fascist pretty soon. I'm really really worried that Italy's going to go fascist pretty soon." And boom, they would do it. You know, you just you keep turning the pages through the documents, and he's like, "Oh, Mussolini has taken power in Rome. I am sad." <laughs> and the. the the idea that there was an economic connection between these things to Keynes was just obvious. It was common sense. I feel like you kind of have to argue that now in the United States in this weird way politically, um, that, that there's a connection between economic policy and social disruption this way, which I don't, th I don't think you actually have to do in Europe. Uh, in Europe, people just kind of accept this. Uh, they might deny whether or not their particular policymaking is responsible for, for, for the rise of fascism, but the idea that these things are connected is is just common sense over there. So in a certain sense, it was it was nice being around other people who I think sort of saw this connection between economic and social policy the way I did. Um, certainly being in DC, you would just talk to people on the Hill and they'd be like, oh, well, you know, all we care about is growth. Uh, and so long as, the, so long as we have growth, everything's fine. And you kind of be like, I, okay, uh, but you know, there are these, people in the industrial Midwest who like don't have jobs and their communities are rotting. Like, are you, you're not worried about that? They're like, no, because of all the growth. <laughs> and you're, just, you're, you're like, what, what met, why would you look at these metrics this way? And I felt like, I don't know, there, there are some things with Keynes when you go through his letters, I, he just has this incredible capacity to communicate to other people. And, and he, you could, I don't want to say that he felt the way I felt looking at these things, but I felt a real sense of, um, there was a real resonance with a lot of his letters when he's talking about coal miners going on strike in 1926 and saying, like, we're not going to work for this terrible wage anymore. You want us to, you want us to eat a 10 or 12% pay cut, you know, you know, buzz off. And, uh, and Keynes being like, what are they? Oh my God, they're going to, there's going to be a huge strike. The country's going to go into revolt. And, and of course the country did go into revolt in 1926. They have this huge general strike in Britain and it's this enormous moment of upheaval where all of the labor unions just refuse to go to work because of the conditions that are being demanded from the government. And I, you know, in a sense, I feel like we're seeing some of that today. Uh, I, I, you know, obviously George Floyd's uh, killing is the, the spark for all the unrest around the country in the United States right now. But I think they're underlying that is there's this deep sense of unfairness that, that everything, not just the police, but everything in life is slated against working people, whatever color they are, but particularly black and brown people. And that, and that there's, there's no way to, to, to guarantee yourself a, that, that, you know, that, that tomorrow is going to be better than today. Um, that, that the political system has abandoned, uh, not, just a, not just a few people at the margins, but most of the country really. And I think that, that sort of sense of, that, that crisis is something that Keynes was concerned with and it always, it just makes his writing come alive in a way that most, you know, when I read an economics journal, like, you know, I've read plenty of academic, economic material. It, it doesn't have the same sort of fire behind it. When um, you know you think about Keynes and Keynesian economics, people I think think that oftentimes what I gather is that people think that Keynesian economics means that government is supposed to prime the pump, you know, just kind of grease the wheels when the economy slows down. You you do a little bit of fiscal stimulus, you increase government spending a bit, and then you can safely take your hands off and the economy will find its uh, way back to an equilibrium path. And there's no need for sustained presence uh, on the part of the federal government. So looking at where we are today and recognizing that the risks are 
continued social unrest and, you know, opportunities for people who might want to take advantage of those anxieties and that unrest to, you know, um, take us in a, in a fascist mm -hmm. sort of direction. What do you think if we could have Keynes in this chat box with us, um, you know, would he say, do something to safeguard uh, the American people, you, you got to provide jobs for everyone. You have to safeguard health care. You have to provide education. Would he embrace, do you think, an FDR style New Deal program for the 21st century? You know, I think he would be uh, I think he would approve of your work, Stephanie. But I think he'd be very frustrated <laughs> by the fact that it's necessary. I think he would he would say, you know, look, we know that these technical questions about money and numbers are just technical questions about money and numbers. We have a climate crisis that's approaching us. We have this huge breakdown in international relations between the United States and China. The European Union is disintegrating and we know what's happened in the past when the European states have gone have, have not gotten along and has not mm -hmm. been good for the rest of the world. Um, and we have deep inequality in just about you know in every country, uh, however you know whatever stage of development we want to describe them as being in, uh, we have deep inequality within each country and then also between countries. So he would, I think, be talking about he would be trying to devise some grand plan that could be used to 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 kill many of these birds at once or with you know with with one stone. Uh, I mean, I, he he really liked birds, so I don't think he would be trying to kill birds with stones. <laughs> One of his big complaints about America was that there were not enough birds in the countryside here. He felt like the English countryside had had far more birds, so it was really a much nicer place. Uh, but he would want he would want to try to to do more than one thing with his economic policy. He wouldn't just want to cure unemployment. He would want to also solve the, the climate crisis. He would want to fix the relationship between the United States and China. And then he'd probably also he'd probably have a separate agenda for Europe. Frankly, it's just you know it's this so only so much you can do with one policy. But it'd be a very grand plan, and it's not the sort of thing that you can do by just asking, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase and Morgan Stanley to, you know, to, you know, lower some interest rates on some loans. It, it's it's not something that can be done without coordination somewhere. So he would look to the state, I think, as the body that could coordinate this type of action. What he would prescribe, you know, I find it hard to predict, frankly. Like he is somebody who is always changing his mind. Uh, and he was not ashamed to change his mind. It's one of the things I admire most about him, really. Um, you know, he, he got all sorts of stuff wrong. He's deeply politically naive. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I think he's just too conservative and just misunderstands the way the world works. But he is okay with admitting when he's wrong and, and changing course. Um, it's hard for me to imagine. I, I, I will, I will admit, I think he was probably smarter than I am and may, may be able to come up with, with big plans that I have, not, I have not seen. But I do think he'd be looking at people who were rolling out proposals like the Green New Deal and saying, that's the kind of thinking we should be, we should be working with. We should not be working with these sort of tax incentives to encourage certain types of private private behavior, he would say, "Look, we have we have crises that have to be managed. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and manage them." Um, and that, no, that so Keynes would not have been a he would not have been a nudge guy. <laughs> I mean, I I do not want I don't want to rip Cass Sunstein because he uh, he tweeted out something nice about my book. So Cass, you know, I appreciate it. Uh, but no, I don't think so. I think I think Keynes. It depends on which Keynes, you know, because he he is he's. He changes his mind, like I said, over the course of his career. But certainly by the end of his life, you know, um, Keynes loses almost every single political battle that he engages in between 1919 and 1941. When he starts winning, it's when the Labour Party is in power in Britain, and they're the Socialist Labour Power Labour Party, very, very explicitly socialist in an era when being socialist was a much more like dangerous thing than it is today. And the thing that he his first real policy victory is serving as the financial kind of technician for the British National Health Service. So he socializes British medicine and it, in, in, is not a minor player in that. He is one of the main guys who gets the British National Health, Health Service enacted. And he's doing this when Britain's basically broke in, in World, War, World War II, when, when you know, the Blitz has devastated Britain and they've, they've lost so many thousands of lives. In, in the war. So, uh, you know, he's somebody who's capable of thinking very, very big 
uh, even even with your back up against the wall. Uh, and I, I certainly think he would be, you know, if, if he could if he could socialize British medicine in 1943, <laughs> I certainly think the new the Green New Deal would seem like a pretty you know. In a lot of ways, I feel like um, Keynes, Keynes would have been mortified by the the rhetoric of the Bernie Sanders campaign, not not to to bust up your old boss, uh, or maybe he's your current boss, I don't know. But uh, the, the, the talk about revolution would have made Keynes very, very uncomfortable. But in in certain respects, I think he he would have said, you know, the the policy agenda that that Sanders is pursuing, uh, is if anything, maybe a little too timid. You know, you have to think big. These these crises are very real, and they are bearing down upon society right now, and we are seeing the effects of them in real time. Um, so I, I I certainly would see him as somebody who would be who would be talking about the Green New Deal uh, and and coming up with some very very complex diplomatic solution that probably uh, none of his diplomatic solutions ever worked. So it probably wouldn't have worked but some, some way to try to resolve the tensions between the United States and China. Um, let me ask you one more question, and then I know there are a lot of people who want to jump in with, with their own questions. But, you know, we hear people talk about in, inequality, income and wealth inequality all the time now. I mean, this is just commonplace. But Keynes um, opens the last chapter of the general theory, the first sentence to the last chapter of the book reads from memory something like, the two great flaws in our economic system are its failure to provide for full employment, think about where we are today, and its arbitrary and unjust distribution of income. Maybe he says income and wealth. You know, I probably uh, don't remember it exactly. But that Keynes called out, you know, then when levels of income and wealth distribution, the, the degree of inequality looks a whole lot like it does today. So I just wondered, and, and I don't really recall seeing a uh, greater treatment of that question, the inequality um, piece in Keynes's other work, but I haven't read it the way that you have. And I wondered whether you discovered that he had a lot more to say about inequality in some of his other writing. Yeah, Keynes is deeply concerned about ec economic inequality because he's he's worried about societies being able to hang together. He's worried primarily about revolution. He's, he's a Burkean conservative in the sense where he doesn't want to see the people rising up and overthrowing the system. He thinks that the disorder and chaos that results from revolution is not worth whatever prosperity might come from a new system that is built. So he's always trying to, to sort of do what you can with the existing structures of society. Um, but if you if you go back and read the economic consequences of the piece, his big work from, from 1919, he basically says, look, economic inequality is unfair and the economic system of the Gilded Age, which basically ended at the opening of World War One, um, was a ripoff for working people. And and the only reason people bought into this was because they believed sincerely that tomorrow was going to be better than today. And once you break that faith in the future, which the war had done, it'll be impossible to restart this engine. Now, I think the story that Keynes is telling there in, in 1919 is wrong. I, I don't think it's the case that people had this deep faith in the future in 1908 or 1903 and thought really if they just kept working hard enough that tomorrow would be better than today. I, I think he was coming from a particularly elite perspective, but he is clearly concerned with the idea that escalating inequality is unsustainable, that you have to find some way to make people feel part of the same social project together and that move, that idea is deeper than his economic sort of technical policy prescriptions. He's, he's much more concerned with these sort of moral and political beliefs than he is with whatever particular policy agenda that he's, that he's concocted at any given time to try to pursue this. So, you know, there, there are periods in time when he's basically like a Milton Friedman kind of style monetarist. Um, but when that doesn't work, he just says, okay, well, let's, let's do something else. Um, so I, I think, Inequality matters to him on this moral level that is is it is fundamental to the way that he thinks about the world and uh, and and he he just does not believe that deeply unequal societies will be able to hang together um, and and he says this from the position of somebody who wants to enjoy all the fruits of being on top he he loves going to the opera and art openings and he was married to a ballerina the most famous ballerina in London you know he's just you know he loves the high life. But he doesn't want to lose it and he feels like if you do not have a more equal society if you don't let people participate in that high life then he won't get to enjoy it either because people will revolt 
Yeah. And you said you said a more equal. And that's another thing that he points out in that last chapter. He's not talking about an egalitarian distribution of income and wealth. In fact, he says, you know, we just have too much inequality. And so what we need to do is, you know, rein it in. But he he goes out of his way to make the argument that certain amount of inequality, in his view, actually does serve um, some useful purpose in terms of, you know, incentivizing people and innovation and that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. And, and Stephanie, I, I want to ask you th this question about your work, because I, I feel like there are times when uh, the focus on MMT is understandably about deficits and debt. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think the sort of more radical implications of your work seem to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, to suggest that we can focus more on these questions of distribution than we do on on questions of say growth, which is what economists typically are saying, you know, so long as we grow the pie, everybody's better off. Um, am, I, am I wrong about that? Have I misread you in some way? No, do you mean questions of distribution just with respect to income and wealth with inequality? Right, right, inequality. Yeah, yeah so um, one of the things that MMTers have always pointed out with respect to what is the role of taxes in the economy, we've been taught to believe that taxes are primarily um, useful because they're the source of revenue to the federal government. It's how the government pays the bills, and MMT rejects that and says, no, taxes are important for a lot of reasons, but that ain't one of them. And one of the reasons that taxes are important is because it does give the government, gives Congress a lever to pull, to uh, realign the distribution of wealth and income. If they want to make adjustments to the tax code, not because they need to peel a few bucks off of a billionaire here and a billionaire there to fund education or do some infrastructure investment, but because they genuinely want to tackle the problem of extreme concentrations of wealth and income inequality in this country, then it's perfectly legitimate to set forth uh, with an ambitious agenda to adjust taxes on the very wealthy for no other reason that to, than to realign the balance of distribution. I think in a lot of ways, um, Zach, we don't go far enough because we look at the very wealthy as a pay for. And lawmakers say, well, we want to, you know, do infrastructure. We want to put some more money in education. We want to improve lives for the broad majority of people. But we feel like we have to pay for it somehow. So we got to get money and we get money by raising revenue. And we don't want to hurt the people in the middle and the people at the bottom. So we're going to concentrate all the pain at the very top. That's where the taxes will fall. The problem from my perspective is um, while that might be perfectly legitimate to try to pass a bill that says we're going to spend to you know increase uh, money for Pell Grants or infrastructure or whatever, and on, alongside that, we're going to increase taxes on the rich. Very often what I've uh, observed in my brief time in the Senate and in my longer journey as just an observer of you know the political process is that even Democrats are very reluctant to increase taxes on people at the top. There's this notion that it's punishing um, success in some way and you know the job creators will be hurt and we you know so what happens is we pair that you know desire to spend more on education or whatever with, a need to raise taxes so that we don't end up adding to the deficit. And that forces lawmakers to pick two fights. And you don't just have to pick two fights, you have to win two fights. You have to convince enough of your colleagues to vote for the increased spending on education, and you have to convince them to close the tax loopholes or you know, to introduce a wealth tax or whatever it is. And if you can't win both of those fights, you don't win on your agenda. You don't get the increased spending for education. So, you know, it's uh, it's a double edged sword, uh, this game of trying to play by pay go rules to avoid adding to the deficit. But um, MMTers and myself included look at Democrats sometimes and say, you know, when you approach taxes this way, you're not being nearly ambitious enough because you're just trying to peel off enough to cover the cost of whatever it is you're trying to do. So in the case of a wealth tax, for example, if uh, if the wealth tax is to take 2% from you know people with very large fortunes, mm -hmm. and then at the same time tell them, but don't worry, you're not even going to feel it because your wealth is going to accumulate at a much higher rate on an annual basis, then what's in a sense, what's the point? 
right? What's the point if they're not going to feel it? You're not going to address the extreme concentrations right. of wealth inequality. So I do approach the tax question differently. And uh, I think I come at it with a more ambitious um, desire to see realignment and rebalancing. You know, these extreme concentrations of income and wealth inequality aren't just bad for the way our economy functions, it's bad for the way our democracy works. So. Can before we go, uh, Tom, mm -hmm. and Tom, I think I think we will want to have some questions from the audience in just a second. But before we do that, Stephanie, I, I have a question for you about sort of the the Washington um, legitimacy kind of etiquette, because I feel like for a long time, and, and there there are very good people on Capitol Hill who are you know brilliant, thoughtful folks who will listen to arguments no matter where they come from, but there are a lot of people on Capitol Hill who are not brilliant and not thoughtful, and and they don't so much listen to the arguments as they listen to like the prestige that surrounds the person who is saying them. So like, you know, in 1989, if Alan Greenspan had showed up on the Hill and told everybody that actually all horses are really hand grenades. Uh, so we really have to stop riding them because they're about to explode. People would have just said, oh man, you know, I really got to stop riding all these horses. Um, and they would have, they would have believed him. Um, did you notice a difference? Cause you've been talking about this stuff for a long time. Did you notice a difference in the way that you were treated um, by by folks on the Hill after you started working for the Senate Budget Committee? Did that did that have a uh, any sort of change in the in the way that your sort of ideas seem to resonate with with staff? No, I don't think they resonated with staff. I I don't feel well, Zach. I talk about it a little bit in the book. You know, I think there was um, a certain degree of surprise when I showed up that. Um, you know, they were accustomed to dealing with deficit hawks, people who want to balance the budget really mm -hmm. fast, get it done and get it done quick. And the deficit doves who were sort of more apologetic and tolerant of deficits, while they also wanted to see them balanced, they were willing to go more slowly. Uh, but those are the only two sort of birds they were uh, accustomed to. And then I show up. And, you know, I coined that phrase years ago, the deficit owl, to distinguish my own <laughs> views from these other uh, from these other birds, and I remember that. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> I know you've been you've been living there um, in Texas, right? And no, no, no. I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in Virginia, but yes, we have we have this family of owls living out back. You yeah. have this family of owls. <laughs> it's fantastic. I think of the deficit owl every time I see you tweet a picture. But but the the, the quick story is that people were taken aback. Uh, they didn't. Uh, a lot of folks didn't realize exactly uh, what I was and that people actually had views like I held. Um, and I think it took some getting used to. And, um, you know, I think it over a period of time, maybe there's been, they've been taken more seriously, but it, I wouldn't say that it happened in that short kind of span of time that I was there. It was a warming up to, but not, uh, not a full embrace of mm -hmm. the kind of way I think. Okay, well, Tom, I, th I think we're ready to, to field some questions here if, uh, if, if you've got... Has anyone asked any questions yet? We have quite a few, actually. Um, we're not going to have a chance to get to all of them, but I will read the ones that have the most votes. Um, so the first question with the most votes is, what, if any, would be the impact of MMT on the Social Security Trust Funds which consists of exclusively of special obligation treasury bonds. I feel like that's for you, Stephanie. Well, okay, so MMT per se doesn't have an impact on Social Security, but I did write a whole chapter on entitlements and um, tried to make the point that, you know, FDR set up Social Security back in 1935, and he argued that he set it up the way he did so that, these are his words, so that no damn politician could ever put his hands on my social security program. Okay, that was almost a direct quote. Um, and what he did was say that everybody was gonna pay into it. You were gonna see your contribution in the form of a payroll tax withholding. You'd see the money go in and then upon retirement, you would draw your earned benefits, right? And um, so today we have a situation where we continue to believe that the only way the government can maintain its promises to future retirees, to their dependents, to the disabled, is if there's enough money available to do that. So we started as a consequence of Alan Greenspan and his commission in 1983, started building up this massive uh, trust fund. 
locking up digital dollars on a spreadsheet called a trust fund and saying, well, if we just have enough spreadsheet entries and there are enough dollars locked in place, then we can release those dollars in the future when we need to make the benefit payments. So MMT points out the insanity of this and the proposition that the government needs to lock up its own currency in digital form uh, in order to be able to spend its own currency in the future. And so, you know, what I argue in that chapter is that there's a really quick way I could do it with a single sentence amendment to the Social Security Act of 1935. I could make the whole problem, quote unquote, go away with a one sentence amendment to that act. It's just about granting Congress the legal authority to make benefit payments, regardless of the balance in the trust fund. Okay. Uh, this next question, uh, you kind of talked about it a little bit, but it is, it's uh, this person asks, how do you think Keynes would have reacted to Congress's actions with COVID relief, i.e. PPP loans and such? How do you think he'd approach our current economic situation? Uh, I don't want to hijack this one, Stephanie, but I think, I think this no, one sure. is sort of uh, yeah, my territory. Uh, you know, I, I think Keynes wouldn't have been worried about the amount of money being spent. I think he would agree with everything Stephanie has said about debt and deficits so far. But I think he would have been deeply troubled by the way that the money has been spent uh, and, and about the conditions that have been placed on that money. I, I think um, the point that Stephanie made earlier about, about Keynes believing that the general theory of employment interest in money sort of unlocked this ability for the government to tackle inequality directly uh, as, as sort of a, a way to make markets work better. I think he would have looked at this rescue and said, you know, this is a lot of money for the richest people in the country and not a whole lot for everybody else. And and I think, you know, he also would have been, I, this is this is a more deeper philosophical question, but the, the question about work versus welfare in particular, you know, Keynes didn't want people to have to work their whole lives. Uh, he had this he had this sort of utopian view of of a world in which we all had fifteen hour work weeks. We spent the rest of the time, you know, doing art and and writing poetry. Um, I think he would have wanted that in in a certain sense, but he also understood that people take a great deal of moral and social satisfaction from from having a job, um, no matter how many hours they're working. He might want them to not have to work all the time, but he recognized that people like participating in their community through their work. Um, and so uh, the fact that we were putting a lot of money into um, expanding unemployment payments instead of uh, making sure that people didn't lose their jobs, I think would have troubled him. Um, that, that's, I, you know, I think Keynesian scholars could, could dispute me on that, uh, on that point. But more broadly, he would have just said, look, we need to rescue the economy. We have to do something. And we, and we do have to rescue the rich. We do have to, like, it's not good if all these corporations just fail. Uh, but he would have said the focus needs to be on on income support for all of these people. And I don't think the 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 bill that was passed by a 96 to zero margin in the Senate um, focused its priorities uh, on on the types of things that 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 animated Keynes throughout much most of his life. This next question is for Stephanie. Um, this person wants to, uh, to know if you could Walk through the mechanism that explains why deficits do not matter. Well, let me reiterate first that my position is that deficits do matter, but not the way we've been taught to believe. So they matter in a lot of ways. They're, the, they're a, an important source of corporate profits, for one thing. So um, let's put that aside, because there's a Koletsky profit equation, and I, I, we don't have time to go through that. But let me do it the quick and dirty way. Okay, when I say every deficit is good for someone, the deficit is the difference between two numbers, right? One number is how many dollars the government is spending into the economy. The other number is how many dollars the government is subtracting out of the economy by taxing us primarily, okay? So that we use this term deficit to describe the condition when the government adds more dollars into the economy than it subtracts. We call it a deficit. But what we forget is we could just as easily call it a surplus. We're using the word deficit because we're describing what's happening on the government's ledger. But if we were describing what's happening on the other ledger, the outside of government part of the economy, we would call it a surplus. They spend 100 in and only tax 90 away from us. 
that $10 that gets deposited becomes our surplus. The real question is who got it, for whom and for what? What was the government doing? Was it building hospitals and schools? Was it repairing infrastructure? Was it paying for health care? Was it dealing with climate change? Or did it just become a windfall to the people who least need the help? So deficits matter a lot, right? They are a financial deposit that shows up on somebody else's bank account. The question is, you know, for who and for what? Okay. I think we only have time for maybe one more question. Um, so I'm going to ask this one to Zach. Uh, this person would like to know a little bit about Keynes and the Bloomsbury Group. So Keynes comes of age at the turn of the 20th century, and he's hanging out with all of these people like Virginia Woolf and E.M. Forster. Uh, they're, they're writers and artists, and uh, it, it's a, a, a very, uh, it's certainly given the strictures of British society at the early 20th century, it's a very liberated group. So these people are constantly swapping lovers. Um, Keynes is very enthusiastically gay for most of his life until he falls in love with the most famous ballerina in uh, in Britain um, and marries her, uh, and then they have a you know a wonderful marriage that lasts the rest of his life. Um, but these people, in a lot of ways, are sort of the the moral authority in Keynes's life. He's not somebody who is looking around to pe you know if you if you hang out on Capitol Hill long enough, which I think both Stephanie and I have done, for, you know. For better or for worse, quite a bit. Um, people on Capitol Hill are sort of looking to like what, you know, what what business groups and lobbyists are going to think about what they do. Keynes did not. He was never looking over his shoulder to say like, what's pharma going to say? What's Wall Street going to say? He was looking over his shoulder to say like, what's Virginia Woolf going to think about what I'm doing? He always felt this very intense moral pressure from these people in his life. Um, and, and that pressure extended to the fact that he was even working in government at all. They were like, why are you wasting your time in, in this terrible you know, stuff of public administration? I mean, you could be a writer, you could be a poet, you could be a painter, wouldn't that be a fine thing? And, and of course he's, he's doing it because he's good at it, right? Um, and it's, it's actually quite good for the world that he's doing it because he's, he is good at it. Uh, but, but they're constantly sort of riding him and saying, you know, make sure that whatever it is that you do, is living up to these ideals. And Bloomsbury has this, in certain respects, I think very naive view of the world, where they think that the power of love and art and letters is capable of breaking down all of these barriers between people that have been built up through political systems over time. So you know, if you, if you just show people the right paintings, if you read them the right novels, they'll be able to communicate across different borders and different languages and understand each other. It's a really beautiful vision. Um, and and they're constantly just telling Keynes, like, live up to that, live up to that ideal. And uh, and they're the only people in the world who can really convince him that he's gone astray in any moral sense. So I think Keynes, as a as a member of the Bloomsbury set, uh, he's kind of an odd duck because he's, he's the only economist in the Bloomsbury set. Everybody else is an artist or a writer. Uh, but in a lot of ways, he is sort of trying to realize their vision on the world stage, it, make, it, make it something that is material in concrete in in public policy and certainly by the end of his life i think he's quite successful at that i, th I think the british national health service is a great example of that uh but you know his his great work uh his first great work the the, the economic consequences of the peace is largely you know an apology to bloomsbury for his role in uh, in financing the the first world war for, for britain he's basically telling everybody in bloomsbury you know, I was wrong. This war was pointless and a lot of people died and it, it was for nothing. You guys were right and I was wrong. Um, it, that that dynamic is there throughout his career and it's 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 really significant. I think it make, it's one of the things that makes him a very unique economist. Well, thank you so much, guys. This is a really fascinating talk. Um, I want to remind everyone that you can purchase The Deficit Myth and The Price of Peace, peace by clicking the green button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, thank you so much, Zachary and Stephanie, for being here with us tonight. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.